Hello, my name is Sandra Shattuck and welcome to the community of writers. Today my guest is Logan Phillips. He is a poet, DJ, artist, educator, and I would add a poet activist. Um, so thank you so much for coming. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Excellent. So I want to start off just with that huge number of roles that you play and then go into Snore and Strange. Sure. Um, and I really believe that uh, you do the cultural work of at least four laborers. I mean, you just do an amazing amount of cultural work. You founded or co-founded several nonprofits. You do poet and resident gigs all over the place, including this summer at the Pima County Library. Um, and I was wondering, how do these identities enrich each other, and are there moments when they collide or compete? <laughs> <laughs> um, of course. Um, you know, I think it's really the, uh, you know, that idea of being a cultural worker is something that was, um, helped me really clarify why I do so many things and what those many things are. Um, I believe, to begin, that poetry is not separate from society, but poetry is woven into society. And it's really not at the margins of uh, who we are and what we do, but it's really at the core. And so I think part of the role of the poet is not only to create verse, but to create more room in the world for verse. And so a lot of those endeavors, like education um, especially, are kind of doing that work of widening access to the literary arts, to self-expression, um, and helping folks kind of develop the, um, the ear for each other, right? The ear for each other's expression. Um, and they definitely collide, you know, after DJing until 2 a.m. I'm not waking up at 5 and writing poems, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think you tend to focus on the people whose voices are not invited into the conversation or not so much? Um, I think I'm, I try to be conscious of where my attention is not going right, as well, right? So I think of kind of start with voices or characters that seem most central to my, th you know, that come to mind immediately. And then I try to um, kind of widen my circle of concern, as um, uh, former President Obama put it when he came to Tucson in 2011, talked about circles of empathy and widening the circles of our concern. And that at the time um, very much resonated with my artistic process, right, in which I'm trying to push um, the ways in which I think and the ways in which I um, deal with people kind of into um, just areas where I, w I don't go immediately being who I am and who I was raised to be. So I think that um, really looking for an opportunity for all voices to be heard and to be expressed themselves is, very, is the work. Okay, cool. And I guess I have kind of a follow-up question before we get into Sonoran Strange. Sure. Because you're a poet, you're a spoken word performer, you're a visual artist. You work with um, Verbo Valo, so you're doing a lot of video work, um, drawn work, you've got a map in here, mm -hmm. and music. So those are all an incredible range of art forms, and how do they interweave for you? In other words, do they, do they kind of talk to each other and inform each other? Um, so how do you see that? Because it's, it's so eclectic and really cool. Sure. Um, you know, I think it's kind of um, all of a whole to me. They don't, very, they don't seem very separate, and I think of them frequently as poems, whether they be um, video pieces or whether they be um, silent performance pieces. I think of poetry as being my kind of lingua franca or the way that I first encountered art, and so that when I'm sitting down to revise a poem, um, the ways in which I think about that text on the page are similar to the ways in which I'm going to think about um, a drawn piece or a um, piece of sound art or um, even a workshop, right? And so um, there are certain ideas that need multiple media to really be um, expressed and that was kind of the founding idea of Verbo Bala is that we can't talk about these things without having image and sound at the same time. Um, and so I think that that's kind of the, also the lens of the fronterizo, fronteriza, the idea that um, borders are fluid and b borders also conjoin things rather than only separating things. And so genre is just a great example of how we get locked into a, 
um, a way of seeing the world that's based kind of in the violence of naming and nomenclature and, yeah. and separating things, right? And keep trying to keep everything uh, very compartmentalized when really all of us are a mix of things all the time and most artists move in multiple genre, especially these days. I lied, I'm not getting to that just yet because <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing that strikes me is the collaboration that you do. So when you do film or you do music, it's not just you alone. It seems like a lot of your art um, is on a foundation of collaborative work. Would that be true? I think I, th I, th I can see that, yeah. You know, I think the work of the poet um, starts as a very solitary act. Um, to paraphrase Neruda, uh, the poet goes and then comes back. And uh, that's been very present with me uh, for a very long time, and um, even as a child. And so that work kind of starts there, but then maybe because of that, also there's an impulse towards community afterwards. And a poem both requires community to exist and creates community in, his, in its existence, or at least a successful poem, I would hope, would engage in some way or offer something in some way. Um, and so, yeah, it's uh, coming from starting out my performing career in Poetry Slam, where it's a very individualized art form and kind of one person at a time usually, um, really helped me understand that I wanted my continuing art practice after that to be very much a collaborative um, piece because I think there's just so much more richness when we're in conversation with each other and kind of destabilizing the cult of the individual and destabilizing the mm -hmm. kind of putting the artist up on a pedestal and thinking they're so great and we could never ever do what they do. That's not very useful. <laughs> that's useful to maybe sell CDs or downloads or whatever right. um, in the music world, but that's not useful at all in right. building community or even building an arts practice to my mind because that leads to um, fragility within a community and it leads to um, kind of a non-sharing of resources. So all of those things are kind of present to me when I'm thinking about working with other folks. Right, cool. I guess I would argue with you about the slam poetry because I, you know, I think of mm -hmm. slam poetry and I think of sort of like academic readings of mm -hmm. poems and with slam poetry, it can't exist without the audience. The text just can't live by itself without the audience there interacting. So that's, that's a very good point. And to be fair, I did learn so much about community organizing and touring and um, collaborating with other folks on writing and all of those skill sets kind of were born of, during my time in slam poetry. So I, I can see that side cool. as well. Cool. Okay, now I'm going to fulfill my promise. We're going to talk <laughs> about Sonoran Strange. And um, I think if we just go ahead and start with the relationship to the land, since it is called Sonoran Strange. And I, I would like if you would just go ahead and read a poem so we can hear, hear your words and your voice. And I guess if you would do uh, Sonoran Strange Chukson, that would be great. Sure. This is a poem that comes towards the beginning of the book, but usually in performance we put this one towards the end, sometimes even ending the performance with this one. Oh. This is for the endangered languages. This is for the unnoticed realities. This is for the lesser recognized senses. This is for anyone who has forgotten their mother tongue. Este va para cualquier migrante lingüístico refugiado en el verbo. This is for every mouth that once spoke Mexican and now speaks sand just 40 miles as the vulture flies from where I now stand. This is for anyone who drinks earth in the end. No water for their lost thirst at last. This is for every cactus ripped out by the roots to make room for 18 holes. This is every snowbird on their last flight golfing one last 18. This is every Gila monster driving a dropped Cadillac through desert. This is for every rancher resisting the city. This is for every language teacher alive in the tongue dance of history. This is for all of the cotton that was pulled from the irrigation and woven into tires for World War I. This is for all of the copper that was pulled from the pits and made into bullets to kill men fighting in trenches World War II. World War I, this is for all of the men fighting and mining in trenches, wearing their jobs on their flesh like a skin color. 
This is for every youth who still remembers. This is for every elder who still imagines. This is for every chingona. This is for every fronterizo. Este poema va para Tucson. Su sin fin de sueños, su historia presente, su tiempo cíclico, sus barrios arrasados, sus estudios étnicos, su Spanglish, su gringañol. Este poema va para Tucson, para todos los cabrones y todas las cabrones que aquí viven, que aquí cantan. Arizona, aguanta. El pueblo se levanta. Arizona, aguanta. El pueblo se levanta. Arizona, aguanta. El pueblo se levantará. Thank you. That's such a powerful, powerful poem, some powerful images there. Um, and I was reading the interview in Sokolo, and I was really struck. I mean, when you talk about your father as a park ranger and that he also gave you the gift of paying attention to history and your mom as a public school teacher, so you spent summers in the library. But the story in Sokolo that really struck me was when you were a kid and you guys were living at the foothills of the Huachucas and the developers' neon flags would come in and you'd go out and you'd just rip them out and you'd keep ripping them out and then finally the bulldozers would come. And that struck me um, because you talk about the colonization of the land. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk more about the relationship that you have to this part of the country, the land, and what you call, and this is a phrase that I love, mm -hmm. the psychogeographic landscape of myth <laughs> in this place. That's from one of your poems. Yeah. yeah, well, that's a lot. That's a big question. I think um, so the book, in some ways, is a, is a way for me to explore the answer to that question. And so I don't know if I could sum it up in a shorter way than the book, but I will say um, that it's, you know, I think coming into the world, all of us are of the place where we are born and raised, and we later learn of our social identities and relationship with the society around us and how those things interact with our families and ourselves as individuals and as collectives. Um, and so being a child, one is uh, largely unaware of systems, right? Systems are invisibilized to the child. And so um, I knew first the land, um, and that area is a very interesting area because it is the um, ecological borderlands between the Chihuahuan Desert and the Sonoran Desert. Um, it's high mesquite grassland, and so the land kind of rises, and then as it falls again, it falls into the um, deserts of New Mexico and Chihuahua. And so on this side, on the western side, is the Sonoran Desert. And so I think, um, looking back on it now, even being of kind of um, that meeting place, right, um, later, would later come to help me understand why I am the way I am. Um, and then just looking at the, the border as a child and not you know, understanding exactly what was so different about the land that was on the other side of the barbed wire fence as it was in those days. And um, so I then think of the layers of culture that are painted upon the land, right? And every human um, grouping paints their own histories and their own stories onto the land, neither really um, explicit and um, and kind of connected ways, like um, some of the uh, traditional Apache um, beliefs in relation to birthplace and, and geography, um, or very violent and colonial ways, as in property development and subdivisions and things like that. But all of us are, in, to some degree, using um, the natural world to manufacture self or manufacture um, our own kind of co cosmovision of things. and. Um, so then later, you know, understanding that, I was, that I'm white and born in a white family and being on the border and understanding the many privileges that I, was, that I have um, going for me in that space and in this space and understanding what is to the margins of that and what is um, at the expense of that and vice versa is very, was very telling to me. And so I come to this place like as being, you know, second generation Arizona and both my parents ra uh, raised in Phoenix. Um, but then going a few generations back and being of ranchers and miners and um, of in other Western states, immigrants, um, and kind of trying to synthesize that all as we're all doing is, is to some degree, is very um, complex. 
And so when it comes to the psychogeographic landscape of myth, I think about these myths of lost treasure in the mountains and the superstitions and the Huachucas. I think about um, the myth of manifest destiny. I think about the myth of um, even like economic pres prosperity and mo or the myth of so moving in a place towards, uh, towards economic possibility um, is moving towards a promise, right? There's also historically the promise of health that happens even now, like the moving of to a drier climate to help with respiratory um, inflammation and things like that. And so there's all, I mean, it, the, the list is endless about how we interact with land in that way. And I think thinking of it through that lens, we can begin to not only see the structures that were inv invisible to me as a younger version of myself, um, using kind of the land as our baseline, um, but also begin to work against those structures and dismantle those structures. That's, I like that because it's really applicable to anyone, anywhere. It's a really cool way of looking at the relationship to place. I like that. Um, so let's move on to, you have a lot of poems that uh, pair, but I think I want to move to the Lupe and La Llorona po poems. So you, you revise um, the Virgin of Guadalupe and La Llorona, and I, I find these poems, there's, a, there's humor in them, and they can be very playful, and something very cool is going on. Um, I do have some student questions. Jasmine Castillo asked, why did you choose to make poems about the Virgin Mary? What does she mean to you? Because some of, the, some of my students wrote about uh, Catholicism and not being sure that you were being as respectful of that figure as you needed to be. Mm -hmm. David Ortega, uh, what inspired you to use Lupe and La Llorona in your poems as if they were everyday people? Um, and I, I mean, I love these poems, so maybe if you could, if you could read, um, it's on page 72, Lupe, real talk over Raspados, and maybe talk about Lupe a little bit, and then we can talk about La Llorona and see what sure. you think about that. <clears throat> Lupe, real talk over Raspados. Mostly, I don't give a shit what they say about me. It's not like I need their permission. Really, they just like that I'm popular. It's been that way from the beginning. What do they call that? Swag by association? John Paul acts like he knows me. We just met. I never promised him anything. Not like any of them are paying my bills anyway. I have all these sisters coming to me all the time with that man drama. Don't need any of that myself. Did you see that house they built me in El Defe? Shit's crazy, girl. Everybody always showing up on their knees, though, all bloody. I mean, I never asked them to do that. I swear, sometimes que a la banda le gusta sufrir. Straight up. I should have bought stock in a candle company. Mi prima Maria is talking about opening up an abarrotes ahí por el altar, selling veladoras, pero le dije que eso se llama algo como nepotismo, and besides, sería mal visto, de muy mal gusto. Closest thing I ever had to a man was that dude Juan. We weren't together, but people make assumptions, you know? Saw us together, and him with the roses, and just assumed. I was hanging with La Raza Esa all the time then. But again, what? Bishop What's His Name hears about it, starts acting like he knows me, like I'm one of their crew, and I'm like, yo, since when did I ever agree that I just stand there smiling and keeping my mouth shut? That ain't me. Damn, girl, I told you I was gonna get all worked up over this. You finished? What'd you get anyway? Beso de Angel? What? <laughs> It's a great ending to that one. I love it. Yeah. So the, the student questions were really, you know, what is the Virgin Mary to you? Why did you make her a, a contemporary sure. woman? Uh, well, you know, being born to a Catholic family myself as well. Uh, my family's all Irish Catholic um, on one side and then um, very Catholic on the other side as well. Um, you know, these figures were always kind of hovering around, not so much in my, my parents' households, but in my grandparents' households, and the way that these figures were um, spoken about um, always seemed very distant and very um, aloof in a way. Um, and so my personal relationship was, is not um, as close as many folks. Um, and this, in a way, these poems, in a way, are um, 
uh, an invitation into um, kind of modern contexts of these figures um, as a way of myself understanding what they stand for and what um, could be said about the ways in, that they would th think of the world and see the world now, um, given the modern lens. And they are also designed to be less reverent than texts would usually consider them, um, with the idea that um, it's if we're going to talk about someone as a real human, every human has their facets and their complexities. And um, so many of these historical and religious figures are always presented to us just in a two-dimensional mm. sort of form. And um, throughout the book, not just with these two characters, but uh, throughout the book I'm trying to um, really uh, add or look for the complexity or the alternative stories happening with any particular figure um, because it's never as simple as it seems. Mm -hmm. I like that. So maybe the t two of the Yorona poems, um, Yorona standing near canal at midnight, which is on 67, and then Yorona standing uh, near canal at dawn, which is on 80. Okay. They're short, but I just, I love, there's so many beautiful images in those poems. Sure. So the short setup to this, is in this book, Yorona is um, haunting the canals of Scottsdale, um, the, the Arizona project, uh, uh, Cent Central Arizona project, SRP, Salt River Project canals. Um, and she is alternatively either a saint, um, a ghost, or um, someone who is homeless, um, depending on the gaze. And these are two different gazes. Yorona standing near canal at midnight. A moon mirage amid night shadow. She takes small steps in sand along cement bank. The sound of sirens at night, the orange of city sky, and whisper of jets, distant traffic. Staring at the slow water of the Arizona canal, she looks for them here along the cement channel in the paved over indigenous design dark hoodie over layers of clothes thin skin thin bones gallon jugs yellowed and brittle from sun liquor mixed with the bottles abandoned by backyard parties bottles holding bodies of drowned scorpions millipedes mice Small snakes. She collects the drowned, sings to them. Yorona standing near canal at dawn. A shadow haloed in sun glare, unseen by eyes that cannot see her, that choose to look away, ignore her, joggers and headphones. She adds her salt to the canal dead water Unsilent grief, river of salt, valley of sun, canals become saline. Their waters pull salt from the land. Palm trees, pigeons, hawks on power poles, mourning doves. Beautiful. Thank you. So, although you're not using Spanish there, that's the the next question, which mm -hmm. is your use of, um, I mean, you're referred to and call yourself a bilingual poet, mm -hmm. no? So there's so many choices that you can make when you incorporate another language. Um, you can translate it in context, give footnotes, all that kind of stuff. So what are the linguistic choices you use as a bilingual? Yeah, what's your? Um, well, first and foremost, in the first stage of writing, I'm trying to um, write too much without thinking, to write without thinking about audience and writing, trying to write in the ways in which I think and in which I speak. And um, especially when I'm interacting with my Borderlands communities, I speak in Spanglish and think in Spanglish and lived for a long time in Spanish only. And so um, first there's that, there's the, the sounds of language and not worrying about the borders between the two, right? And if a word has um, particular connotations in one language that it doesn't in the other language, 
and looking towards those connotations that I'm interested in bringing in um, without worrying about all of these other questions like identity and politics and audience and rhetoric and all these kind of things that get later put on to the creative expression, right? Um, right. But in revision, there's a lot of decision making there. And, you know, there's, an, there's a lot of intentionality around the fact that, like, neither language is italicized because it's a particular language in the book, right? Because um, that seems to me always very much like a textual othering of, of Spanish or whatever um, non-English language is present in a text. Um, and then there's uh, slant translations, non-translations, um, wrong translations, all kind of given in the context of the poems. And that's kind of thinking about the ways that I understand language and interacted with language being a monolingual white kid growing up on the border around lots and lots of Spanish, trying to hold my own in high school in both languages. Um, and then finally living in um, Mexico de Efe for um, many years and um, looking at things linguistically inverted. Um, mm. So I try to bring uh, my own kind of confusion and, and exploration and love of Spanish um, into the poems. And if I'm being my most honest, I'm writing in Spanglish. I think we, we're going to have about one more minute, so I've got a question from Delaney Davis, who said, what was the hardest thing about writing Sonoran Strange? Oof. It's a good way to end, I yeah. think. The <laughs> hardest thing is just to do it, right? The hardest thing that we all have is to just sit down and make it happen, um, because uh, there's a whole lot of other life happening around us all the time that is trying to get us to engage with it. You know, it's like the phone not notifications in my pocket, and it's the bills, and it's the all the uh, family obligations and community obligations, but really just to create the time and space to be able to explore. Um, it took months of um, months and months of many uh, hours, usually right when I would wake up in the morning, of not letting myself do anything else, but just getting the coffee and putting my butt in the chair and seeing what would happen. Um, and I think that was probably, for me, the hardest part, although there are many other hard steps as well. Right, that's fantastic. Um, we might have a couple more seconds. So sure. Delaney also asked, um, what do you most want your readers or listeners to get out of your poetry? Um, I think that that's not really for me to say. I think all great art, or which all art that I aspire to make at least, um, I don't know if it's great or not, but it aspires to a certain, um, a certain sense of the vague that will allow readers and listeners to insert themselves into it and interpret certain things um, in a way that is most useful to them. Mm -hmm. And so um, even engaging these like cultural icons like we talked about a moment ago in a way that is different is a, is a chance for, I would hope for readers to understand, okay, this is one way that this figure could be represented. What are the other ways that I would represent this figure? What is my own relationship with this figure? Um, and that could be said for any of the elements in the poems, especially elements that would be considered cultural or point out to wider society, that all of us have our own relationship with the, those things. And I would hope that these, these poems would be an invitation to research, to investigate, to understand more of this place and each of our own relationship with it. It's a great way to end by inviting everybody to do that. So we're, we're out of time. Um, so thank you for joining us on the Community of Writers. Um, thank you so much, Logan, for sharing your wisdom and your art. Thank and you very much. We'll see you all next time. Thank you.